Whether you're joining us from the US, Europe, Africa or Asia, once again a big hello and a very warm welcome to the show. Let's get cracking. You know, 2021 is a pivotal year for climate action, of course, to curb carbon emissions and limit global warming. While President Biden has rejoined the Paris Agreement with promises to spur a green economic recovery, there are worries, some big worries, that governments and companies are moving just too slowly. And, of course, as the global energy sector shifts from fossil fuels to renewables, there are fears. There are fears that millions of workers will get left behind. Take a look at this. I caught up with Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, and Francesco La Camera, President of the International Renewable Energy Agency known as IRENA. And I began with ladies first by asking Sharon why she felt that fair transition to green energy is just so important. We accept the science. We know that we have to get to net zero, that more than half of that has to be done by 2030 to have any chance of stabilizing the planet. But of course, you know, investors talk about no stranded assets. We agree with that. We have $40 trillion of workers' capital, pension funds, in the global economy. But we also say no stranded workers and no stranded communities. We can design the way we want to invest in the future on a net zero basis, or we can leave people and communities out of the equation. Francesco, you know, many countries and, and companies have signed up, right, to sustainable development goals, SDGs as they've known, but your latest report that that is just not enough. I mean, you say climate action, well, it must be more ambitious and, and certainly to see the acceleration in the scale and the pace. The more we delay to take decisive action, the more it will be difficult and more costly to win the battle against climate change. And uh, this means that uh, the pathway to get to the need zero is narrowing day after day. The energy transition is already in place. We know that the energy system of the future will be based on renewables and complemented by green hydrogen and modern bioenergy. But to get there, we have to do fastly. If we don't do that, the consequences are the consequences of the, of the climate change. And as uh, Sharon have said, in a dead planet, there are no jobs. Sharon, you campaign for a just transition. And I'm just wondering, you look, if we accelerate the shift to green energy, do you think governments and businesses, do you think they're, they're ready? They're, if they're ready to support all of those who will lose their jobs. And then on top of that, how do you reskill that workforce and provide them with secure jobs and, and a decent wage? When I actually took on this job now, just over a decade ago, and we looked at the due diligence underpinning investment in the transition to a clean economy, we were shocked to see that it was like, you know, zero point something percent from our pension funds. We set a target based on actuar actuarial advice at that point that said if you got to 5%, you could actually get the tipping point. Well, that is that is just so far now away from the reality of what Francisco decides, describes, and that is that every investment, every dollar, every euro, every unit of currency has to have an ESG lens. Francesco, let's talk about money here because the Think Tank Carbon Tracker 
says that petro nations will face multi, multi-trillion dollar losses or holes, if you will, in their government revenues, their government monies, as they make their shift towards greener energy. Isn't that going to be a huge burden? Certainly as the pandemic has, well, completely hammered many of the, the state's finances. What we have discovered is that if we accelerate the path to the net zero in the next three years, and invest two trillions per year in the energy transition, we will get 5.5 million good jobs. And if we continue in this trend, we will add 11 million jobs in 2030 and 42 million jobs in 2050. Renewables are the most competitive way to produce electricity today in large part of the, of the world. But Sharon, on the jobs front, isn't there a worry or a concern or are you worried that technology and automation uh, could actually reduce the number of jobs in the green energy sector? Do we want a surveillance economy? No. Do we want companies that are actually getting wealthier and wealthier off the back of data theft? No. But when you come to the question of where, does technology exist, then the real question is not whether it exists, not whether it will risk jobs, but indeed how you manage technology so you don't accept technological determinism. Francesco, let's talk further about investment because there's definitely been a shift, right? A shift in, in the investment community towards sustainable investing. And shareholders, we know, are, are demanding it. Do you think that the business case will galvanise the private sector, I guess, towards climate action? There is no doubt about that, Aaron. Mm. But the fact is that that will be not enough. So we need policies. If we invest in the infrastructure for making the grid more flexible, more interconnected, smarter, provided for more renewables, to be distributed. If we will build the network, we will be assisting to the fact that no one will buy anymore the old uh, car, but all we go for electric car, if we can easily put your, your electricity in the car. So if the intervention of the state will go in the right direction, it will leverage private money and it will accelerate the, the energy, energy transition. But Sharon, on, on that point, you know, we heard the, from the big boss of BlackRock, you know, the world's biggest investment fund, make some very bold statements, right? Bold statements about taking money out of fossil fueled or fossil based assets, but not a lot of action, not a lot of action at all. What do you make of that? Larry Fink talks a good talk, but I've heard him say this and I've heard him say every company must have a social purpose. Mm. But the conditionality of these investors who still invest in our fossil fuel companies, they're not making the demands that say you've got X amount of time, five years, for example, and we want to see a, a plan now. We want to see you work with your workers and communities for a just transition plan. We want to see what the governments will do around legislating to make that even faster. But there's a period of time if you're not making the progress towards a sustainable future, then our investment is out. You talk about equality if I may, is that we have also to talk about the equality between the north and south of the world. So it will be very important that in building the, this new energy system, the value chain the, uh, the, uh, will be taking into account the fact that the industrial sectors of developed, developing country should be part of the creation of, of the values. Sharon, you want to come in there? I wanted to say that the energy market, first of all, you know, if we look at what governments give in subsidies still to fossil fuel companies with no conditionality versus what they do for renewables, it's a scandal for governments who are responsible for actually helping the transition. In addition to our concern about good jobs, so people will transfer with confidence, the energy market in Europe is still 27 different countries. 
Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in the old way, we used to think about tram lines or train lines across the border, then it's no different. You know, big companies will find the interface. Let me tell you, having to mm. tell workers that industries they've built, that they're proud of, that have sustained communities have to shift is not the easiest job. But, it, but you can't be a leader if you're not going to tell the truth and actually be prepared to do the work. But Sharon, just briefly, can I ask you this? Are you encouraged or how encouraged have you been by US President Biden's action on, on climate? I mean, and what would you like to see him do? He doesn't have a lot of time. What Biden did is said climate and jobs. They equate, and we know they do. You invest in climate action of any kind. You have the legislation that says they have to be good jobs and hopefully, you know, union bargaining around those jobs, then people have confidence and we can make it happen. So I felt incredibly relieved apart from anything. Now there's a long journey here mm. and there'll be a lot of, you know, difficulties along the way, but the same with the European Green Deal. We're not there yet. And Francesco, that, that big climate gathering later this year, again, as I said, COP26, the United Nations is describing it as make or break. And apart from the the pledges we're going to hear, what specific um, policies w would you like to see come out of that gathering? For the COP26 gathering, but also for the UN high-level dialogue on energy that will take place in September. Imagine it is the first time after 50 years that the Secretary General of UN convene high-level dialogue on energy. So there are these two tracks where ARENA is participating and supporting the process. So naturally, you already mentioned one point that will define the success of these two gatherings and is the raising of the ambition. So an ambition that is compatible with the path to the 1.5, as we have described in our World Energy Transition Outlook. But more important, and this should be also for the future, the COP will be not a place where we are ne negotiating legal text. The COP should be the gathering where we'll share the experience and we will concentrate on the implementation of our commitments. So uh, what we are doing, we are the best experience, what we can do better, partnership with the private companies. Sharon Burrow and Francesca La Camera, we really appreciate your time. How time does fly. Thanks for joining us. Both stay safe and well, and we'll check in with you soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you to you all.